All right. In this video, I want to talk about Mary, uh, known as the Virgin Mary, and even at times the Mother of God, or even the Queen of Heaven. What I want to do in this video is actually talk about the truth about Mary. I don't want to disrespect Mary and spit in her face, or even disrespect and spit in the face of Catholics. Uh, and I know at times that's how you take it when people disagree with you. But the actual problem here is that people have taken Mary and they've exalted her and put her on this pedestal and made an idol out of her. So anybody who comes along saying that, hey, she's not this idol, she's not exalted here, you take it as disrespect, as an insult. But that's uh, uh, not what's going on. The problem isn't people disrespecting her, it's people idolizing her and turning her into something that she's not, basically a goddess. As you can see with this picture, just typing in the Virgin Mary, I'm going to go back later on and show some of the pictures on how they have done this. But they take Mary, a poor, humble Jewish girl, and they've turned her into this goddess, queen of heaven, being crowned by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right? And this is not something that we actually read in scriptures. This is tradition that comes from the Catholic Church. This is not something that comes from Jesus and the apostles in the early church. This is something that is brought in because of the religions surrounding Judaism and the religions that the Roman Empire conquered that they all mixed together. Now, I'm hoping that you. You're humble enough to hear me out and see why I'm saying this, all right? The first thing I want to get into is how Mary is a sinner, hence the title of the video, right? Mary is a sinner, just like the rest of us. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Over here in Leviticus chapter 12, it talks about childbearing. And the law concerning childbearing. So I'm going to get into this real quick. It says here at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman hath conceived seed, and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation of her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her separation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. And when the days of your purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering onto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation onto the priest. Now, this is the part I obviously want to focus on. After the days of purification, after she's had the child, she brings a sin offering for her sins. Right? And this is what we actually see Mary do. Over here, in Luke chapter 2, and you can read even at, uh, I guess you could start at verse 21 if you wanted, you know, eight days were accomplished and they circumcised Jesus. And then it says, and her days of purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord, and to an, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And we see that's exactly what we read for a sin offering. That's exactly what Mary does. Because she's a sinner like the rest of us. And even in the little song that she sings, uh, I might actually be in Luke chapter 1. She actually calls God her Savior. 
And if she's not a sinner, she does not need a savior. There's the John of, and the, of John the Baptist being foretold. There's Jesus. And I'm not sure. Here we go. Yes. Mary's song of praise. And she says at verse 47, And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. So if she was born sinless and had no sin through her life, she would not need a Savior. So this doctrine of Mary being sinless is not true. It's man-made tradition, right? So that's why you have people who come about saying, hey, you know, you're making Mary into this idol. And that's exactly what's going on because Mary's just like one of us. And she's chosen by grace. And what grace means is it's unmerited. God just chose her because he chose her. Right? That's who he decided to choose. Not because she's better than anybody else. Not because she's more pure or because she's sinless. It's because of grace. That's just who he chose. Right? It do, it's not a, oh, I chose her because she's better than the rest of you. She's perfect. She's sinless. Right? She's somebody you need to look up to. That's not, that's not how it was. Right? Uh, especially since it has a lot to do with her being from the line of David. <clears throat> uh, but anyway, I am going to come back to, I don't know why it went to Luke chapter 3, but let's put it back to 2 because I'm going to come back. Why is it on Revelation? This is kind of weird. That's strange what happened right there. But let's uh, put it back real quick. I am going to come back to Luke chapter 2 just for something else that it said here. Uh, but something I want to bring up that's also something that's in the Old Testament is a law concerning the husband and wife. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, it says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath no power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Right? Goes on to say, Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt ye not for your inconsistency, right? So here we have um, a commandment, a law, a decree, a statute of how we should be as husband and wife. We give our bodies over to one another. And this is something that is obviously sexual, so that you're not tempted by another woman or a woman tempted by another man or anything like that. You know, you, you give yourselves over to one another so that you can be, uh, what's the word, uh, let's just say you have a, a pure relationship, because I can't think of the words that I actually want to use. You, know, you can be undefiled in your marriage. You know, you just be, uh, man, I can't think of it, you're monogamous you're you know maybe it'll come back to me as i go, go through this but uh, you're faithful and loyal to one another and that's why you give yourself over to one another right this is what husband and wife do over here in genesis chapter 4 at verse 1 it says and adam knew eve his wife and she conceived and bare cain and said i have gotten a man from the Lord, and she again bare his brother Abel. So we see here the word Adam knew Eve. This word here, knew, is sexual. Obviously, Adam knew Eve and she conceived. It's not as if, oh, he just talked to her and she conceived. No, this is a sexual act. Right? That's why when we go over here, I want to read Matthew chapter 1 at verse 25. 
talking about Joseph, it says, And knew her not, her being his wife Mary, till she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So we see here that Joseph had normal sexual relations with his wife Mary after Jesus was born. There's nothing wrong or taboo about that. Mary was a virgin when she conceived Jesus from God. And after she gave birth to Jesus, she then lost her virginity to Joseph, her husband, which is normal, which is lawful, not taboo. There's nothing wrong with that. But making this doctrine, this teaching that Mary is a perpetual virgin, again, you're putting her up as a, on a pedestal, as an idol, turning her into a goddess. That's not true. And I'm not disrespecting Mary. I'm not spitting in her face. This is what the Bible says. You can look at other translations where it says, and Joseph did not consummate the marriage until after Jesus was born, or he did not have sexual relations until Jesus was born. It tells you exactly what this means if you're having trouble grasping what that means. Uh, but just like why I wanted to come back to Luke chapter 2, as you notice, it says, brought forth for her firstborn son. Jesus cannot be her firstborn son unless she has other sons. It doesn't say brought forth her only son, brought forth her only child, brought first her firstborn. That's why I wanted to come back here because it says the same thing. We got another witness here. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, she brought forth her firstborn firstborn son, right? Firstborn. Okay? Very key because we got a couple witnesses over here talking about Jesus's brothers and sisters, right? And this makes sense. There's nothing taboo or unlawful or wrong about this. And for some reason, Catholics take it as an insult to say that Mary honored her marriage and had sexual relations with her husband and had other children as if this is some kind of evil when it is not. You see, it says here in Matthew chapter 13, they're talking about Jesus and they say, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brother and James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Right? And we have another witness. Uh, I try to put up at, you know, at least two witnesses to a lot of these things because that's how you establish something as a fact. What you see with a lot of places, by places I mean like churches, like the Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, even the Protestant churches, they will take one verse and they'll build a whole doctrine out of it, even though there's nothing else in the Bible that collaborates with it, that witnesses that this is true. So they've taken, obviously taken a verse out of context, out of its meaning, and built something out of it that they want it to say, not what it really says. So that's why I try to bring up at least two witnesses uh, whenever I do this. So in Mark chapter 6, but I try not to go too much, like three or four or five witnesses, sometimes I do, just to really dig in the point, drill it in there, but uh, that takes a long time. Kind of like talking about this takes a little bit. But Mark chapter 6 says the same thing. Is not this the carpenter's son? Uh, carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? So he has brothers and sisters through Mary. That's not shocking. That's not wrong or anything like this. And I know Catholics will try to say, that this is, they'll say one of two things. They'll say, no, 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 these are uh, Joseph's children that he had before he had Mary. No, that's not how it is. Uh, the Jews were generally uh, monogamous. It's just a few exceptions that we get out of the 
uh, kings for the most part that went and did those things. But uh, that's a different study on its own. But uh, the other thing they'll say is that these are his cousins. But when you look into it, it calls them brothers and sisters. And when it comes to his cousins, it says they're cousins. It uses two different words. So they make a distinction between cousins and actual brothers and sisters. Uh, so both arguments are uh, basically just trying to dismiss what the scriptures actually say and to follow what the church says instead of what God says. And that's the next thing I want to get into is what does Jesus actually have to say about Mary? What does he say about her? Because that's what actually matters. Jesus is God. What God says is what goes. So you have a choice to make when Jesus says something and it contradicts what your church says. Who are you going to go with? God? Or are you going to turn the church into your God and follow the church? Because that's what you want to believe. you got a choice to make. So we go on over here. In Luke chapter 11, at verse 27, it says, And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee in the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. And this ties into some things I want to get into that tie to Catholic doctrine. But you see here that somebody is blessing Mary, the womb that bare him, and the paps that fed him as a baby. And he's like, no, 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 no. You know who's blessed? Those who actually hear the word of God and they keep it. That's referring to all of us. If we hear the word of God, like we're hearing in this video, when we hear from other preachers, when we actually read the Bible for ourselves, and we keep that, that puts us on par with Mary. As a matter of fact, if Mary doesn't keep the word of God, that puts us above her because it actually drops her down, not because it actually elevates us. Because those who reject God's word are cast down. Right? So, uh, keep this in mind. He's saying those that hear the word of God and keep it. Those are the ones that are blessed. This is very key because he doesn't say those that eat my flesh and drink my blood, eat the bread of life. No, he's talking about the word of God, right? Key what he says here. Remember that. In Mark chapter 3, at verse 31, There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him and they said unto him behold thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee and he answered them saying who is my mother or my brethren and he looked around about on them which sat about him and said behold my mother and my brethren for whosoever shall do the will of god the same is my brother and my sister and my mother so we see here it's about Whoever is doing the will of God that's actually considered family of Jesus. If you're not doing the will of his father, even though by blood you're related, it means nothing. This is what Jesus is telling you when he says, Those who love their father, their mother, their brother, their sister, their wife, their children, they love anybody more than me, they're not worthy of me. Right? Is because he's saying, what matters is the truth. What matters is God. You care about those things. That's what you hold up first and foremost over what your your father says or your mother says, your your wife or your husband, your children, your brothers and sisters, your friends. Then, then you're part of Jesus's family, right? It's not because you're blood related to him. It's because spiritually. You are related to him by faith, right? And that's what the, a lot of this has to deal with is actual faith and belief. It has nothing to do with anything tangible that our eyes can see and grasp a hold of. Uh, but this other thing to connect into, like remember what Jesus said about the word of God. He also says the will of God. 
something else to keep in mind, the will of God. Because over here, we have something very interesting. Why we need to get close to God ourselves. There's many people who can do some really interesting things, and it seems like God's with them. But he's not. Like we read right here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Again, Jesus is talking about doing the will of the Father, right? And he's not saying, oh, just because you call me Lord, Lord, you come into the kingdom. And I know many people, uh, even some Catholics, a lot of Catholics I talk to think that you cannot say that Jesus is Lord unless God's with you. And, you know, you can't be of Satan if you say Jesus is Lord. And that's just their little scapegoat to be like, see, I can trust the Catholic Church. I can trust the priests. I can trust anybody that says this because, you know, they said Jesus is Lord. Even though the Protestants say the same thing, yet they don't agree with the Protestants. So it's contradicting and just kind of foolish, especially when Jesus says, hey, not everyone who says it is going to enter the, into the kingdom, right? He's all on to say, many will say... To me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name any many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So I'm going to start tying these things together here. You see, these people are not doing the Father's will, even though they're prophesying in his name, casting out devils, and they're doing wonderful works. So you can say they're doing healing or charity work. They're doing works, which is what Catholics say, you know, you're saved by your works, faith and works, right? These guys are doing it, and they're calling Jesus Lord, but he says, I don't even know you, you that work iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness, it's sin. You see, what actually removes your iniquity and your sin is actually your faith. What Jesus did on the cross was wash away your sins, to blot out your iniquity. Something I'll get into as I connect all this together. The will of God plainly said in John chapter 6 at verse 39, it says, And this is the Father's will which sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. So you see, the will of the Father is to believe on Jesus, right? It doesn't say to do anything other than to believe. Why? Well, like we read over here, John chapter 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, again, it's about Jesus' word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So just by believing the word of Jesus, we're not going to be condemned. We go from death to life. We can't be condemned because everything that condemns us has been paid for. Our debt is cleared. And if you believe that, you don't have anything to worry about. And it's not just your past sins and your present sins. It's your future sins. It's not as if you have to go do certain things to get this forgiven. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to be uh, going to confessional, uh, taken away for drinking some wine saying a Hail Mary, that's your works. Those things do not take away sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remission is the removal of your sin. There needs to be shedding of blood. And the only shedding of blood that will do that is Jesus' blood. And you have to do that by faith. And I know you'd be saying something along the lines, if you're Catholic, that the sacrament, that's the sacrifice, eating the bread and drinking the wine. That's That's not true. We'll take a quick uh, backtrack here to John chapter 6, we notice that it has to do with believing. He's talking to them about eating the bread of life, and the problem is, like we see here, verse 36, ye believe not, right? Because he's telling him, you're not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Like I was bringing up before, about here, about the will of God, and the hear the word of God and to keep it. That's what he's telling them here. The same thing. But he's saying the word of God is like bread that you need to eat. So you need to be listening to it. You need to be reading it. And you need to be chewing it up in your mind. And you need to believe it. Because believing it is swallowing it. Right? Because when you swallow food, 
It's as if you're believing a word. It's as if you're believing what you're reading and hearing. You make it one with you. That food now is going to be digested and made part of you. It's assimilated, right? But unlike physical food, you don't turn it into shit and dump it out, right? Because they go on and they're like, hey, you know, where's this bread of life? And he says, oh, you got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Jesus doesn't end up giving them actual bread and wine saying, you know, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. He clearly tells them at verse 63, it is, it is the spirit that quickeneth. Quickeneth means to bring to life and to energize, right? What he did with Lazarus, he raised him from the dead. The spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. See, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Hence what Jesus was saying when the people were uh, exalting Mary. He's like, no, those who receive the word of God and keep it, they are blessed. It's blessed because it is spirit and it's life. And then he goes on, the problem is, is that some of you don't believe. And then when these people realize they're not going to get literal uh, bread or any wine, anything to drink at all, he goes, that from that time on, they went back and walked no more with him because they wanted the bread that he fed people with in the beginning of this chapter. He fed 5,000 people with two loaves of bread and five fish. They wanted some free food, and he goes, no, you need the word of God. Because the people that he fed with that actually wanted his word. Right? And then he says to his 12 disciples, are you going to leave me too? And what does Simon say? Where will we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. He doesn't say you have the bread of eternal life. He doesn't say you have the flesh and blood of eternal life. He says you have the words. And guess what? He believes the words because he says, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You see, what Jesus is saying this whole time, every time he's talking to people, he's like, you need to do the will of the Father. You need to take my word and to keep it. Right? He's saying you need to eat it up as if it's bread, as if it's your life. Like Job says, he, he says, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Right? Uh, <clears throat> continuing on here, we see the same thing here. John chapter 3, everybody is pretty familiar with at least verse 16. Verse 15, it says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we see that our condemnation comes from our disbelief and the removal of that condemnation comes by our belief. And what is this connected to? It's connected to being born again. You see, he's talking to Nicodemus about being born again. Because if you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And he doesn't say, how do you be born again? You go get baptized. No. He talks about believing not and believing. Right? And then he says, whoever believes is not condemned. Just like we read in John chapter 5, you believe, you're no longer condemned. The will of God is that you believe on Jesus, as we read up here. That's what it means to eat the bread of life, to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus, is to believe on him. Because when you believe his words, you're taking him in. Like when I'm speaking to you, when anybody's speaking to you, or you're reading our words, you taking them in, you're taking us in. Like right now, you listening to me, you're taking me into your ears. You're taking me in. And if you believe me, it's you're letting me be part of you. If you disbelieve me, you're spitting me out, right? You're chewing up that bread and you, no, I don't like this. I don't want this, right? It's metaphoric, right? Um, can you continue on here? We see that it's believing that gives you the Holy Ghost, not actually doing something physical like being baptized. In John chapter 7, at verse 37, it says, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. 
But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So we see here that it wasn't baptism that gave people the Spirit. It was those that believe should receive. And they didn't receive it because Jesus was not yet glorified. But we actually see that happening with the thief on the cross. He was not baptized. He went from mocking Jesus to accepting him as God, his Savior. And he's baptized with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because he went from death to life. He went from condemnation to debt paid. Right then and there, by simply believing on Jesus. We see the same thing in Acts. Acts chapter 10. Uh, Peter was preaching in what Acts chapter 2 about bat being baptized for the remission of your sins and to receive the Holy Ghost. That's because the dispensation hasn't fully changed yet. It's been going to the Jews and now it's going to the Gentiles and it's going from the law to grace. Right? So there's a transition where Peter's still preaching, you know, the baptism of John the Baptist, right? But he starts preaching that, and then he eventually has this vision of not to call what is been cleansed by God unclean, which is the Gentiles and the unclean animals. God has cleansed everything, right? And Peter's kind of like, no, I'm following the old law. But then he starts to, you know, come around and a Gentile, Cornelius, comes to him to be saved. And he tells him, you know, what does he have to do to be saved is believe on Jesus. And he's preaching, right? Like he says here, you know, he says to be baptized for the remission of sins, right? And he says, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remissions of sins. So you see how Peter finally came around and didn't go from, say, baptized for the remission of sins. Now it's believe on Jesus for the remission of sins, right? It's about simply believing, about faith, faith alone. And we see here at verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them that which heard the words. You see, the Holy Spirit's coming to them which receive the word, right? And they believed. It says here, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So you see here, he before it was baptized to be baptized to receive the Holy Ghost. Now he's saying, hey, they've already received it. Hey, let's baptize them. They, you know, they can show their public confession. Because that's all it is. It's not, you're not saved by baptism. For the, you know, there's no remission of sins through baptism. There's no receiving the Holy Ghost through baptism. The baptism in water is just to outward show to everybody else that you believe. Right? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed him to tarry certain days. Right? So their salvation, the remission of their sins comes from actually believing on Jesus, right? And we see that through that, Revelation chapter 1 at verse 5, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, <coughs> and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right? So we see that this happens by the blood of Jesus, which is where we'll end the video with actually giving the gospel. Because the Catholics really don't give the gospel. They kind of change it up, where it's just simple. Here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, at verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. See, so you're saved by this gospel. And that's present tense. And it says, If ye keep in memory which I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So you see, the issue is if you believe, just like Jesus was saying, the problem is, is that you guys believe not. 
right? In John chapter 6. And he goes on to say in verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So here we have the Gospel. That Jesus died and shed his blood that our sins may be washed away and remembered no more. Past, present, and future. They're gone. And he rose again from the dead to show that he's justified in doing this because he is sinless and he gives us his sinless perfect life. That's how we can know we are saved. Not, not that we're being saved or hopefully will be saved. It's that we are saved. You see, when we sin, it has eternal ramifications. And the payment for the sin is eternal. And the only one that can pay for that is God because he's eternal. So he can actually pay for that sin and keep walking. Right? We can't. We would have to pay for it literally forever. But he can take the punishment on and clear that debt. Right? So, this doctrine of purgatory makes no sense. Because you cannot have people in hell having to pay for their sin forever. But you, you're special. You get to pay for your sins just for a short time in purgatory. That, that's not how it works. You can't pay for your sins. You'd have to pay forever. And Jesus took on that payment. If you could just... Go to confession, confess your sins, say some Hail Marys, eat a wafer, drink some wine, and then go to purgatory. You do not need Jesus. What Jesus did was pointless. You did what you needed to do to go to heaven, and you can go to heaven and go, Oh, I earned it. I deserve it. And you'd be bragging about everything you've done to get to heaven. And that heaven's not full of anybody who's bragging about what they've done to get to heaven. And it's full of people who are praising Jesus for bringing them to heaven and worshiping God. So, that being said, I hope this video was informative and get you thinking. Uh, but I will show some of the other uh, pictures that come up. I was looking at this picture. Mary was in a manger. This was supposed to be a depiction of the birth of Jesus. And we got like pillars. We got this nice little place here. And all these people helping her. When that's not how it was. But it was just showing how, you know, the idolization with all these depictions. Like Mary here with all kinds of babies floating in heaven. That's just so strange. All this stuff going on. Uh, I guess there's one more thing I'll actually bring up. After, you know, just showing all these crazy depictions. Of just exalting this poor Jewish woman. And basically putting her on par with God. A lot of Catholics call her like a co-redeemer, co-savior. And all these things. But that's uh, not biblical. It's not true. It actually contradicts what the Bible says. And a lot of people take this woman here to be Mary. It doesn't say it's Mary. It says there's a woman in heaven clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head the, the crown of 12 stars. Where each star represents the tribes of Israel. Just like uh, Joseph's dream where the 12 stars bowed to him and they interpreted it as, oh, all his brothers are going to be bowing to him. Right? They represent the 12 tribes. This is a depiction of Israel that gave birth to actual Jesus. And it, it can also be a depiction of future events with Israel giving birth to the 144,000. Uh, but we can tell this is definitely not uh, Mary because Mary did not have to flee from the dragon into the wilderness for three and a half years and be fed out in the wilderness for three and a half years while the dragon was trying to uh, destroy her. And then after uh, Jesus was taken up to heaven, uh, this did not happen. You know, there's not anything that happened where Jesus is taken up to heaven because that's what it says. The child is caught up 
And then the woman fled into the wilderness. This is not did not happen. And God didn't play prepare a place for uh, two hundred and three score days, about forty two months or three and a half years for Mary. That did not happen. This is a, a, a future event, not something that happened to Mary. Uh, so, uh, hopefully you can, you know, accept the truth here, humble yourself to realize, hey, this is what God is telling you, this is what God's word says, it's not what I'm saying, it's not what some church you think I belong to is saying, you are rejecting God's word in favor of your church. And the weird thing is, is that you'll say, oh, well, the Bible gives my church this authority and establish my church. But it's like, okay, so the Bible is the authority since it established your church. And the Bible says that Mary's not a virgin, that Mary's a sinner. And Mary had other children besides Jesus. So what are you going to do? Right? You going to go after this church that you, you think that the word of God has established? Or are you going to go with the word of God? Because let's say the Catholic Church was established by God. Does that mean the Catholic Church is sinless and perfect and everything it says is correct and can never err in error and it's infallible? Or is the Word of God the only thing that's infallible? You have to make that choice for yourself. But thanks for watching and take care.